In the year 2000, Mike Krzyzewski published a book called Leading with the Heart, Coach K's Successful Strategies for Basketball, Business, and Life. Now, the book is a fascinating read as Coach K talks through the calendar year, starting in the preseason all the way through the postseason about how they've approached building culture and taking a team through a season. And one of the interesting rules that I remember reading about Coach K's process here is that they do not allow freshmen to have cars on campus when they come into the men's basketball program at Duke University. Now, this isn't some strange form of initiation for the freshmen as they come on campus. It's not something to reinforce their inferior status or put them in their place but rather it's done with the intention of forcing the upperclassmen to be there and provide rides for the incoming freshmen. Now, Johnny Dawkins talked about this tradition in a Sports Illustrated article in 2005, and he said that this helps to create situations and trust, all the things that we're going to use on the court. The article tells the story of the relationship between senior J.J. Redick and freshman Josh McRoberts and the bond that they formed in these five to ten minute car rides back and forth from the practice facility and from the arena. In fact, Redick would go on to describe McRoberts as one of his best friends and actually took him home for Thanksgiving that year to spend time with Redick's family. And as I'm reflecting on how this happened, I can't help but wonder why. What was magical about those five to 10 minute car rides that allowed this bond to be formed? And I think maybe part of the answer is that Josh McRoberts as a freshman had the opportunity every day before practice and after practice to have the undivided attention of an upperclassman, a senior who had gone through everything that McRoberts was experiencing for the first time, playing for Coach K, the demands of the program, the pressure of being at Duke University. And here he had somebody who had walked in those shoes before at his disposal to help him through the challenges of being a freshman at Duke in one of the highest profile programs in the country. Now, coaches, you may be listening to this and think, well, I don't have the power to take away the keys or the car to my underclassmen or to my younger players so that they have to get rides from their older players. But what we want to talk about this week on the podcast is how you can be intentional about connecting older players and younger players, players that have been experienced, players that have been through the program, players that have been through challenges and struggles and allow them facilitate ways for them to be able to share their stories of struggle with those who are following in their footsteps as they go through the program. Welcome to the Coaching Culture Podcast brought to you by Thrive on Challenge. I'm JP Nurbin, joined by my friend and co-host Nate Sanderson. Each week in about 30 minutes, we discuss important principles and strategies of transformational leadership. At Thrive on Challenge, we help coaches to raise the standards and strengthen the relationships in their program because we know this type of culture produces better leaders, better people, and better results. To learn more about how we can help you, go to thriveonchallenge.com, where you can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter and get the coaching notes to every episode of this podcast. Well, JP, when I first heard that story about Coach K not allowing his freshmen to be able to have a car on campus, I really kind of thought it was interesting, but didn't really think that it applied to my situation in high school because I couldn't take the keys away from, you know, kids that are driving to school or or anything like that. But over the years, as I've thought more about what was his purpose and his intention in forcing upperclassmen to have to give rides to incoming freshmen, I started to realize that what Coach K was doing there, I think, was just creating an intentional opportunity for younger players, for players that are first coming into the program with all the uncertainties and all the unknowns to have a place and have a person that they were going to be with for five or 10 minutes before and after practice every day that they could share maybe some of the things that they were struggling with, that they could ask questions to someone who has been there before. And as I've thought more about that, Over the years, I've thought, I need to do a better job of facilitating those kind of interactions in our program. It may look different. We're not going to, again, take the cars away from our players. But how can I start to connect players when they are faced with struggle, when they are faced with uncertainty, when they are faced with unknowns or a new situation or circumstance in our program with someone who has been there before? 
And I think the value in doing that, and we're going to kind of flesh out and tell some stories about how we've done that over the years, is that I can retell stories of players who have been there before, or I can try to connect players to people who have actually been there before so that they can not only hear the story firsthand, somebody that's gone through a struggle, somebody that's gone through a challenge, but they can ask questions and they can, in a sense, talk about what it was like to wear those shoes rather than me just telling them about what it was like. Well, Nate, I think a lot of coaches are intentional in some aspects of their program to try to create some of these collisions, you know, these opportunities for older players in the program to share stories and, and connect uh, with younger players. And I think the big area is recruitment. I know many of the college coaches I work with, uh, the coaches are very intentional in who they select from their current roster uh, to be paired up with potential recruits, you know, the recruits that are coming in on uh, a tour of campus. I mean, even at the high school level, and I was at a private school in Tennessee years ago, but I was really intentional when an eighth grader would come to visit our school that they were shadowing a freshman who I thought might best be able to connect, represent the program, share some stories uh, that painted a realistic picture. Uh, um, and I, and also kind of answer any questions that, that, that individual might have. So I, I, I was intentional. I think a lot of coaches are intentional, especially in the recruitment process and, and maybe even the onboarding process. I just don't think we, we bring that level of intentionality, um, to kind of create those pairing ups or those create those collisions. I don't think we bring that intentionality to other aspects of our program. And I would add to that, JP, that there's one other place that this happens very naturally, and that is when you have siblings that go through your program, you know, and you have an older brother and the younger brother follows, you know, and he's he's got somebody that's always there that he can ask, what was it like when you, you know, were on the JV team? What was it like when you started your first varsity game? What was it like, you know, did coach ever do this or do that? Or, you know, did you struggle with this or would they go through a shooting slump and they have somebody that has gone before them, you know, or that they've been going to practice together for a couple of years, like that's always there to be able to share the experiences that they've had in the program. And, you know, when you think about other opportunities besides onboarding and recruitment, if you think about the life cycle or the, the timeline of a player that goes through your program, think about the moments that are going to be or have been challenging or struggles for just about everybody that's been in that place. For example, you know, a freshman that's brought up to the JV team or a freshman that's brought up to the varsity team. Or think about, you know, the first varsity practice that a junior comes into that's that's played JV for two years. Or think about a player that is starting for the first time or maybe started last year and now they're coming off the bench. Or a player that's in between levels, you know, that play some JV, play some varsity, or an upperclassman that's asked to play a reduced role. You know, there's lots of common places of struggle in the timeline of going from being a freshman to a senior. And we'll even talk about beyond that here toward the end of the episode that I think present the same kind of opportunity to connect players to speak back into those moments where they survived the struggle and not only survived it, but they got something out of it. And, and I want to maybe share our first example. You know, we, a couple of years ago, my first year at Linmar brought up a freshman uh, to the varsity team midway through the season. And that's not something that I've really been in the habit of doing in my career. In fact, uh, Hallie was, I think, maybe just the third player in 17 years that I brought up during the middle of the year to the varsity level. and so you know, particularly at a, a bigger school and, you know, maybe a little bit more pressure and maybe a little bit brighter spotlight, you know, we, we wanted to try to create a transition for her that would make her as comfortable as possible so that she could contribute as much as possible over the rest of that, that season when she was up. And so what we did is we, we orchestrated this meeting. So I brought uh, two of our captains in or three of our captains came in uh, to a meeting with Hallie. And I just told Hallie, hey, we, you know, we just want to talk to you real quick before practice on, you know, Wednesday or whatever it was. And so she comes in and the captains are in and they have this box for her. And I said, the captains kind of, they got something ready for you. You know, they have a surprise for you. And they handed her the box and she opens it up and it's the varsity uniforms. And at first she's like, I don't understand. And I, I said, well, we think you're ready, you know, to come up and maybe even make a contribution. And so, you know, she was really excited about this, obviously. And I sort of gave a little speech about we don't do this very often, but here's why we think that it's valuable for our team. 
But I didn't want to just do this on my own. I really wanted you to be able to talk to our three captains here so that they could share their experience because all three of them were brought up either as freshmen or as sophomores, you know, to the varsity team, having to mix in with older players, et cetera. And I wanted them to be able to share some of that experience and have Hallie be able to, you know, ask some questions as well. And what our captain shared, which was way better than anything I could have come up with, were some of the things that, you know, when you go home at night after your first varsity practice as a freshman playing with, you know, 12 upperclassmen, you think, am I good enough? Do I belong here? Should I shoot it? You know, I don't want to say anything to make anybody mad. They typically tend to defer to older players on the court, you know, and so Murph and Mason, and Allie were all able to speak to that. You know, you're going to think this, that you don't belong here. We're here to remind you right now that we are all on board with this and we think you can make us better. You know, and just speaking into some of the things that they experienced, but not only that, JP, those captains, when they had gone through that transition, did not have upperclassmen that were quite as supportive. In fact, think about the upperclassmen that's going to be threatened by the younger player coming up. You know, they might isolate them socially. They might pick on them. They might freeze them out. You know, there's a lot of ways that they can be resistant to that that makes it much harder for that younger player to come up. And these three made the commitment, we will make sure that you are welcomed and we will be there for you every step of the way. That, so you don't have to experience that piece of it from your leaders or from your seniors like we had to go through when it was our turn. Well, what I think is pretty cool about that story is that you didn't have to do too much. Just create the space and empower the leaders in your program to make that moment special. And yes, I'm going to use that word empower, which I think many people think has started to become cliche, but that's exactly what you did. You empowered them. You didn't make the moment about you, which is, I think, as coaches, we can, I know I can sometimes try to make a little bit about us, you know, with some big speech, which quite honestly, a big speech would have meant a lot less to that player. Recently enough, within my own team here in Ireland, we just signed two American players from Texas who it's their first time in Ireland. And uh, for Kiana, one of the players, it's her first time playing pro ball abroad. And she's only 22 years of age. Now, there's a lot of unknown leaving your family and your life in Europe, and, and it's going to be an adjustment. I mean, it's it, the winters are long and they're dark here. It's cold. It's rainy. It's a far cry from Texas. So one of the first things that I did was actually give her my wife's number because my wife, Melissa, she moved to Ireland first when she was 22. And she did four months here during the winter months. And uh, she's been there. She's been homesick. She's made the mistakes of, of packing. Uh, shorts, which can, you know, on a, on a good year, be worn two or three times, two, two or three times during the year. Um, and now she may not be able to ease all their anxiety, but she can at least share her own story right from the get go. And a- another cool thing that's evolved just in the last few weeks was I was looking to put them in touch with my Irish players. And so I reached out to a few of the veterans and they were more than happy to chat with them. They were really excited to, uh, but they also recommended we put them in touch with former internationals who had been over and played uh, played for our club and they left big time college basketball in the states came over and they experienced many of the challenges that, that our players are going to face but also experienced the great things about ireland and playing pro ball here and and what was great was that they weren't really connected to the club anymore other than just through some of these friendships but I, but i knew they would paint a realistic picture and really help to ground their expectations which is honestly really an important part of preparing for the journey is grounding those expectations. And so once again, this is another conversation that I, I myself as a coach, you know, I really don't have a personal story to share and connect with them on. Uh, and, I, and I could you know, try my best to speak in, into that situation, but just with a little bit of effort of, you know, really not much effort other than just passing along their contact information, we were able to create these unique connections and these unique collisions. I think JP, that's one of the things that we're trying to highlight here are thinking about the struggles that are on the horizon for a player in a particular role or situation. So another example where we've really gotten a lot of mileage out of this over the years is the way that we've initiated our captains at the beginning of the season. So we're fortunate that we practiced for about two weeks right before Thanksgiving break here in Iowa. And so uh, the last couple of years when we've brought new captains on board and we do our voting typically at the end of the first week of practice. And so, you know, our first official captain's meeting happens sometime in that second week. We've started to script it so that it happens on that Saturday morning before Thanksgiving, because all of our alumni typically are back home from college, you know, or players that were with us before. And so 
the last few years, we've invited our former captains to kind of come back to that first captain's meeting and be able to, to similarly share about what is it like to be a captain for us in our program, because it's different than just about every other program, you know, and we've talked about this before, how much I lean on captains almost like an assistant coach in our program. But what does that actually mean? Well, that means that you have to be willing to speak your mind, even when you disagree with the coach. You have to be willing to, you know, share the things that you hear or know are going on on the team with the coaching staff, so that we can work together to be able to uh, address those things. You know, when we had this meeting last year, um, one of our former captains told the story when she disagreed with somebody that I was starting the year before, her senior year, we had to make a change in the starting lineup, and she just told me flat out, "I don't think that's the right decision." And we still went with my decision, <laughs> let's be clear, but it made me rethink it and it made me be able to explain it in a better way to get our captains on board so that they could help carry the water when that decision was played out. And, and it turned out to work out great for our team, but that's what I want from our captains. And it is not an easy job. And so for our previous captains to come in and say, this is what coach wants. This is what it's like to be in the meetings. And this is what's hard about it and share that in front to kind of normalize the challenge and the struggle that likely lies ahead for our current captains. Uh, again, I am and beyond that, just to know that those former captains, but not only have been through it, but were there, you know, reach out, send us a text, get in the old group meet, you know, anytime you want to ask us, how would we handle a situation? We're more than happy to continue this dialogue as we go into the season. I think it comes back to this kind of this, this idea of addressing that fear of the unknown. So this uncertainty of stepping into a captain's role, or in my case, the, the uncertainty of coming to a foreign country during a global pandemic. And secondly, on top of that, kind of communicating expectations. And in my situations, expectations of, you know, what will life be like here? What will the challenges be? And for your instance there at the captains, like communications of expectations as far as, what you're actually expecting out of them in this leadership role. And I think that's important because I think so often I've seen this as a real challenge. Probably one of the biggest challenges of developing a player-led culture is when new coaches come in and they're trying to do that, or you know, a coach says, you know what, I'm committing to this. I want to de design or, or build this player-led culture, is that they start to expect more out of their players to lead they ask them more questions they ask them their opinion and they're uncomfortable with that because they just don't know what to expect because they've never been that's never been put on them before well and then so that they default to either becoming really really uncomfortable or they just tell the coach what they think the coach wants to hear because they don't actually think the coach is genuine in that and i think so much of what your stories is illustrating there is how they're not just kind of maybe communicating the expectations of this is your job, this is your responsibility, but they're also communicating like safety, right? Like they came through it. They're obviously speaking somewhat positively about the experience. And so they're just letting you know like this is okay. This is the way it is. We enjoyed it. We appreciate it or whatever it is, but they're just kind of normalizing. They're helping you to create a safe environment that you know, you could plan the most perfect 15 minute speech to start off, you know, them and their, you know, their, say, as they set off to be captains that season, but nothing that you would say in a speech comes close to them being able to share their experience, to be able to address the fear of the unknown, communicate those expectations and start to create some, a, a safe space uh, for your captain's meetings that, that season. And another thing that can come out of those conversations, particularly when you're talking about initiating captains, is not just you may struggle with this. This may be a challenge. But this was kind of my long term dream is that, you know, in, in our year one captains at Linmar would be able to come to the initiation meeting in year two and not only share this is what it's like to be a captain, but say, here's how the culture and the program grew or moved forward when we were captains. And now we're handing that to you, you know, and then in year two, those captains would be able to come back and speak to the year three captains. And they would hear in year one, this is how the program grew. In year two, we took that and this is how it got better. And now we're handing that to you. You know, I think there's something powerful even about that, you know, that lineage of captains that can come out of some of these conversations. Coaches, I just want to take 60 seconds to tell you a little bit about how you can develop a player-led culture using your captains as a driving force. I've been fortunate 
to work with dozens and dozens of coaches over the last few years. And, and we've developed a captain's council system that quite honestly is probably one of the most simplest and most effective ways to develop a player-led culture. The course is only 47 minutes long, comes with a few resources, and it covers the three phases. All right, first off, it's going to help you to select the captains by you know, creating that job description, the nominations, the voting selection. Secondly, about how to empower those captains from your first meeting through the creation of captain's commitments and your selection of units. And lastly, it's gonna help you to execute the system effectively and simply through really intentional weekly meetings, daily opportunities, and just some other strategies that coaches have found effective over the years. You can get a discount by using the coupon code Coaching culture, you can save up to 25%. We have links to the course in the episode details in the newsletter and on Twitter. So check it out. So here's the other thing I think coaches need to consider. And that is, it isn't just about those transition points in your program, whether it's onboarding or it's someone taking over a new role. But this can be a really powerful intervention when players are struggling in a role. And we've discussed this before in episode 115, where we shared about the four conversations that we have with players throughout the year. But I think it's worth reiterating here that when a player is going through a shooting slump and you have a senior that went through a shooting slump their junior year, just getting them to connect and facilitating a little bit of a conversation of what was that like for them? How did they get through it? You know, how can they speak into somebody who knows what it feels like to know what, you know, the the thought process that goes into every game. And, you know, when you lose your confidence, whatever it might be, again, I can try to counsel players in that situation, but, but for them to connect with somebody who's been there is even more powerful and effective. And that can be, Again, a shooting slump, it can be a player that's playing some JV and they're dressing varsity. It could be a player that's a role player. It could be a player that's, you know, maybe has a reduced role as the year goes on. But any time that you can get an experienced player to connect down or connect back with somebody that is in the situation now, I just think it's more powerful than anything I personally could share with them to help them through those struggles. So as I'm hearing you tell this story, of you connecting players in this way, I'm like, my gosh, I wish I had that as a player. Like there's so many times I went through slumps and I just felt so alone. And I would have coaches in my ear telling me, we got to do this, you're going to focus on this. But I didn't feel like they ever really understood what I was going through. And I think there's a certain element of when we're in a struggle, people on the outside can try to speak into that situation with all the right intentions but it will always fall short if they actually haven't been through it themselves or been through it at least recently enough. And so I think just as you're saying that, I'm just like, Mike, I really wish I had that as a player that could have saved me a lot of maybe pain and anguish that I went through in some of these slumps and and might've been the thing that helped break me out of that. But even if it didn't, even if it wasn't the thing that broke me out of it, at least I wouldn't have felt alone. And I think there's just so, so much power in somebody else sharing their story. When they share a story that you can relate to, even if they don't provide the solution, what they're offering you is where you feel your situation, your struggle is, is known, it's understood, you feel seen in that moment. And I think that's what's so powerful about what you've done in those conversations. And not only that, JP, but I think one of the other advantages in doing this is that when you go through a struggle or you're in a role that's unfamiliar or you're you're feeling alone, there's also this feeling of nobody else is going through this. You know, like you're the only one maybe as as the man, you know, JP is the leading scorer. He's the guy that carries the team, but he can't seem to find the range, you know, for a couple of games. And that feels like nobody else goes through that or has gone through that. And so when you can connect to someone It helps to, again, normalize, no, no, the struggle and the challenge is part of it, right? That's part of the process. It happens to everybody, and that begins to oftentimes reduce some anxiety. And and to think about this even in a different light, in year three at Linmar, we were even starting to try to do this for parents. So one of the things that we did in our new parent meetings, so for parents that have players that were coming into the program for the first time this past year, is we had our captains come in and talk about what's hard about adjusting to being a freshman in high school, you know, that might be different than playing middle school basketball or club basketball. You know, it's a longer season. We practice every day. We lift weights twice a week. There may be film involved. There's more games. You know, you go down the line, like 
that transition can be difficult. And it's one thing to set up freshmen with experienced players to help the player. But I think for us, we were also trying to normalize this for parents that it's a struggle, you know, coming in for many players to adjust for the first time to playing high school basketball. And one of the cool things that came out of this, JP, was that we actually had a, a freshman come in last year who is a stud soccer player. And we've had a couple players that were really good at soccer, really good at basketball. And the parents were concerned that they just didn't know if they were going to be able to balance both schedules as they went through the year. Now, again, this is another situation where I could say, no, no, we'll work with you and, you know, be encouraging and try to explain to them how we've done it in the past. But I took this philosophy, this approach that we've been talking about. I said, well, what if I connected those parents of the freshmen to parents of one of our juniors who was in the exact same situation, elite level soccer player, playing club soccer, you know, throughout the year. And we found a way to make it work for her so that she can play basketball. What if I could get those parents to just share their experiences and be able to answer their questions? So we did. I reached out to the, the junior parents. I said, hey, would you have any you know, interest or be willing to talk to these freshman parents, emailed them at the same time. They had a phone conversation and the, the freshman parents felt so great because they had talked to somebody who'd made it work, right? Who understood the challenges, who understood, you know, the difficulty with the schedule and were able to make it work for their daughter too. So I experienced a similar thing just last year, Nate, running parent workshops for some of the teams I visited. Instead of me just giving more and more of presentations, I actually got parents at tables and got them discussing and sharing their perspective and their stories on various you know, things with each other around sports and their child's sporting experience. And it was so cool to literally see a group of parents whose children playing the same team. They walked in the room. They were awkward. They're quiet. They didn't really kind of acknowledge each other too much. And then they're all walking out together and they're buzzing, they're chatting. And it just, they, they just had connected through that experience. And it wasn't anything like anything amazing that I did with them other than just create a few opportunities for them to share and connect some of the challenging times for them as a parent with, with their child when it came to their sporting experience. And that, that sharing of those challenges was all they needed to connect. And I think that's the dream, right, JP, that parents would be able to speak back to, to parents that follow them, that players would be able to speak back to players that follow them. And I think that can be applied to even coaches as well. You know, when you have a transition on your coaching staff or you come into a new position and you know, I remember being able to take one assistant with me when I started my last job and inherited five coaches, there was a point in one of our summer meetings where I just said, look, if I think it's probably good for you guys to talk to to Coach Mattis that came with me just to be able to pick her brain about what is it like to work with me and work for me, you know? And so we kind of set that meeting up and I wasn't even part of it. But again, it was an opportunity for her to share, you know, some of the things that we do differently that might be an adjustment for them and, and uh, some of the things that are great about coaching with me and maybe some of the things that are challenging about coaching with me. Um, and so it, it just helped to sort of onboard those coaches as well. Well, I don't want this to sound like a plug for our TOC mentorship program, but you talking about coaches connecting, I mean, it's honestly something that has kind of unintentionally evolved over the last year with coaches in the mentorship program. I mean, if you think back to just a little bit over a year ago, since our coaches retreat out in, in, in Utah, we've been continuously looking to connect coaches. We've been encouraging them to share their challenges with parents, with a lack of leadership, with a lack of confidence, uh, because we know it's important. Because sometimes we think we're the only one going through these challenges. I mean, I know that was my story five years ago when I started writing about my experiences that kind of led to uh, TOC starting up. But the powerful thing is, is the TOC community has evolved from just a one-on-one -on -one mentorship and consulting relationship to now where coaches are connecting our roundtables, our group chats, um, our small group calls. We've seen friendships grow from these experiences, friendships with coaches literally across the world, friendships with small time high school coaches and division one college coaches and friendships with coaches who happen to have been coaching the same city for the last like 20 years. And so it's just been so rewarding to see coaches at every level connect, who not just share the same vision, but share the same challenges and, and, and a similar story. And JP, as we wrap up this week's episode, the last thing that I would challenge coaches with is that your influence and your intentionality about connecting people that have been in your program 
does not have to be confined to freshman to senior year. You know, if you're getting current players to reach down into your youth program and talk about their middle school experience or thinking back to their playing in third grade and what that was like, all the better, right, for those players to be able to connect down. But we've also started thinking about what happens when players leave the program. You know, we have seniors that graduate. They're going off to college. They don't have an older sibling that can tell them what it's like or that's going to meet them there. So we bring alumni back and we do a dinner over the over the summer just for them, current players that are in college to be able to speak to our seniors that are going into college and just share their experiences and let them ask questions. And the more you can start to think broadly about the timeline and the things, the challenges that you might be able to facilitate relationships and conversations about, the more powerful your impact is going to be on those players' lives. So I know I just mentioned the TOC mentorship program and community. One of the things that the coaches we support have shared with us is that for a lot of people going from listening to two guys on a podcast to actually scheduling a call with them, that, that's a huge step, especially when they don't understand what the heck they're getting into. So alongside the link to schedule a call and the episode details, that's always there. I put in a link to a YouTube video that kind of gives a brief three minute overview of the mentorship program and community. Uh, but also we have dozens and dozens of coaches who are more than willing to hop on a call with you to share their own story of how they joined and, and honestly why they haven't left. So check out the link in the episode details to schedule a call or just shoot myself or Nate an email with any questions you have.